Hello, welcome back, my friend. Today we're talking about chapter three of Dei Verbum. And this chapter is sacred scripture, it's inspiration and divine interpretation. Stick around. These are all relatively short chapters in this document. Most documents don't have very long chapters. This chapter is articles 11 through 13, and that's what we're gonna do today. Article 11. Those divinely revealed realities which are committed and presented in sacred scripture have been committed to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For Holy Mother Church relying on the belief of the apostles holds that the books of both the Old and New Testaments in their entirety with all their parts are sacred and canonical because written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author and have been handed on as such to the church herself. Scripture is written by God. God is the author of scripture. He's the divine author of scripture. Divine inspiration through the Holy Spirit makes God the author of scripture. In composing the sacred books, God chose men and while employed by him, they made use of their powers and abilities so that with him, acting in them and through them, they, as true authors, consigned to writing everything and only those things which he wanted. Here we have the human author and the divine author. Dual authorship, human and divine together authored scriptures. And in here it says that the human authors as true authors. So they weren't, the Holy Spirit wasn't like whispering to them, write this, write this, write this. The Holy Spirit was saying, write what you know. Write what you remember, write what happened, write what's true. The Holy Spirit wasn't sitting there going, okay, in the beginning, keep writing John, in the beginning, that's not how it worked. Therefore, since everything asserted by the inspired authors or sacred writers much, must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit, it follows that the books of scripture must be acknowledged as teaching solidly, faithfully, and without error the truth which God wanted put into sacred writings for the sake of salvation. Okay, scripture's inerrant, which means it can't be wrong. Scripture's not wrong, scripture's always right. It's just a matter of how we interpret it that might not be right all the time. We'll get there. Therefore, all scripture is divinely inspired and has its use for teaching the truth and refuting error, for reformation of manners and discipline in right living, so that the man who belongs to God may be efficient and equipped for good work of every kind. There we're quoting 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, article 12. However, since God speaks in sacred scripture through men in human fashion, the interpreter of sacred scripture, in order to see clearly what God wanted to communicate to us, should carefully investigate what meaning the sacred authors really intended and what God wanted to manifest by means of their words. So what did the human author intend? The human author could intend different things. So what is the human author intending and what does God intend based on what the human author intended? It gets kind of complicated sometimes, but basically if you look at the epistles, they're the writings of the apostles to the churches that they founded. They were letters. They weren't like, they didn't think that their letters were going to be read for all eternity. I'm pretty sure they didn't at least, but you know, never know. We need to look at what the sacred author intended and then what God intended together. To search out the intention of the sacred writers, attention should be given, among other things, to literary forms. For truth is set forth and expressed differently in texts which are variously historical, prophetic, poetic, and of other forms of discourse. The interpreter must investigate what meaning the sacred writer intended to express and actually expressed in particular circumstances by using contemporary literary forms in accordance with the situation of his own time and culture. For the correct understanding of what the sacred author wanted to assert, due attention must be paid to the customary and characteristic styles of feeling, speaking, and narrating which prevailed at the time of the sacred writer and to the patterns men normally employed at that period in their everyday dealings with one another. In other words, you have to look at the culture and you need to understand where this book's coming from before you can like say, oh, it's just wrong because first of all, scripture can't be wrong. So you have to look at how it's writing it. Like why are there two accounts of creation? There are two accounts of creation in case you didn't know. They're both in literary forms. One is told in a fashion of a myth and the other is told in the fashion more of a poem. And it's really kind of cool when you look, know that and you look at them and you can see what, uh, what, what do you think the author was intending there? We don't know for sure what the author intended, but we know that neither is meant to be read literally. 
because they're, they're not written that way. So it's really cool when you start looking at the different genres in the scripture, especially when you get to the Psalms. They're all songs. So does it literally mean that the hills are leaping up and down? Uh, probably not, unless it's like an earthquake. So you gotta like really look at what is the, what form are they taking? The epistles are letters. They were written as letters. So they have the form of a letter. They have a greeting, they have a body, they have a conclusion blessing at the end because they're letters. So it's very important to know what form, what literary form the book is that you're reading in scripture. But since Holy Scripture must be read and interpreted in the same spirit in which it was written, no less serious attention must be given to the content and unity of the whole of scripture if the meaning of the sacred text is to be correctly worked out. The living tradition of the whole church must be taken into account along with the harmony which exists between elements of the faith. It is the task of exegetes to work according to these rules toward a better understanding and explanation of the meaning of sacred scripture, so that through preparatory study the judgment of the church may mature. For all that has been said about the way of interpreting scripture is subject finally to the judgment of the church, which carries out the divine commission and ministry of guarding and interpreting the word of God. So here we have a few different things in this, this section. We're hearing how important the content and unity of scripture is. Content and unity of scripture, very important. Remember that, content and unity of scripture. They, they go together, scripture goes together, scripture is not going to contradict itself. Looking back again, you can say, well, doesn't it? There's two accounts of creation, which one's true? Well, you have to look at what the genre is, what did the authors intend, because they can't contradict each other. The Old Testament cannot contradict the New Testament, and the New Testament cannot contradict the Old Testament either. You have to look at them together and see what's the thread that goes through, what's the truth behind sometimes the apparent contradictions, because they're not contradictory when you really look at them and know where they're coming from and study what is actually said. Stuff that comes off seemingly contradictory isn't really. You have to look at everything all together. You can't just take one verse out of context, um, out of the content of Revelation and then try to tell people what it means. It also says that um, the work of the exegetes, those who are studying scripture, needs to be done within the church. As we've seen earlier in the series I've been doing on Dei Verbum, the church exists to protect revelation. And as such, the church will say what is and is not what God intended out of what he was saying. Individual theologians don't have the protection of being the magisterium that was that God entrusted revelation to. The bishops and the cardinals in union with the Pope, that divine teaching office, that wonderful gift from God that says, they, yeah, we're going to stay, we're gonna say what's right, we're gonna preserve revelation, we're gonna hand it on truthfully in all of its content. Article 13. In sacred scripture, therefore, while the truth and holiness of God always remains intact, the marvelous condescension of eternal wisdom is clearly shown, that we may learn the gentle kindness of God, which words cannot express, and how far he has gone in adapting his language with thoughtful concern for our weak human nature. For the words of God expressed in human language have been made like human discourse, just as the words of the Eternal Father, when he took to himself the flesh of human weakness, was in every way made like to men. We're getting a little bit of an analogy here between the incarnation of God becoming man in the person of Jesus Christ and God taking his word and making it something we can understand, making it fully human into this wonderful book that we call the Bible. So the Bible isn't written in a language that we don't understand. The Bible isn't written in something we'll never understand. The Bible is written in our language, in words we can read, in ways we can actually understand. Just as when God became man in Christ, we could understand Christ because he was human. So too we can understand the word of God because it's written in words that we use. It follows patterns of speech that we use as humans. And it's very, it's a human book. And it's not something that just fell from the sky already written. It was written by human authors under divine inspiration. It's really beautiful when you look at it like that. This book, the Bible here, is pretty awesome. Like the best book ever written, probably like the best seller of all times. I think it actually might be. Anyway, best book ever, really, the Bible, written by God. Yeah, authored by humans and authored by God. It worked, we get them both and the Catholicism again. 
that was chapter three of Dei Verbum. Thank you so much for watching with me. Make sure you comment down below something that you learned in this video because I'm always learning stuff when I read through this document. And let me know if you have other ideas for videos. I will see you all next time. God bless.